certainly deem this a grand privilege tonight to be here in Louisville, Mississippi. We've looked forward for this time for quite a time. And I thought that to get to Louisville, I'm just across the river from Louisville, Kentucky, my native home. It seems like coming home again to be in Louisville. Now up there, some of them call it Louisville, Louisville, and Louisville, and I don't know what it is here. I think the best way, way I've always called it was Louisville. Look like L-O-U-I-S would be Louisville. But back home, it's Louisville, and Louisville, and Louisville. So we just take a choice which one we want to use. The main thing is that we're gathered together in the name of the Lord Jesus. We've assembled here for no other purpose but to serve Him. And that His great name might be uh, honored among us. More when we are when we are meetings over, and it could, if possible, as it could be now, we know that we honor him with all of our heart. And now I have come here upon the invitation of the ministers of this uh, locality through here, and this place. And I have come not with something uh, different from them, just the same gospel. And I believe Jesus said once that the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that taken a, a net and went to the sea. And when he cast it in, he threw all kinds. Now that's what we get in the gospel net. When a man throws a net into the sea or to the lake, he hardly knows what he's going to get out of there. Because he could get uh, crawfish, and he could get uh, scavenger fish, he could get spiders, uh, serpents, and, and whatever more. But... Uh, it's our duty to sing. It isn't our duty to judge. And I've come to take my net that the Lord has given me and lace it with these man's nets. That we, two nets, will reach out just a little further than one net will. So I've laced my net with you, brethren, here. All you people here belong to these churches around here. I've laced my net with you to cast out into the sea here and draw in and see if the Lord's got some, uh, some down here that hasn't been caught yet. And may the great gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ be so identified among us in these next five nights here that we will see that all those who are not caught at this age may be caught in the, the gospel net for the master's use. Amen. Now, we, this cannot be done alone, alone. It must be done with cooperation and prayer and all of us together to blend together and put our hearts together and pray and now we've enjoyed a, about a 15-year revival, which according to history is longer than any revival has ever lasted, to my knowing. Usually a revival lasts about three years, and then it gets scattered. But believing that this is one of the last great revivals that the world will receive, and it's come in the last age, the Lady of Sin age, at the end of the Pentecostal dispensation. And I believe the church now is going out into its lukewarmness, as the Bible predicted, and we're seeing just the catching of the last part. When we see things happening like it's been happening in the world in the last few days. For instance, the great earthquake in Alaska. Never has been an earthquake like that in all the world. Did you notice it? Come on Good Friday. You know, the last time the world was shaken was on Good Friday too, when our master died. And it shook the whole world. And remember, it might be the sign of him returning. He said that there'd be earthquakes in diverse places. Today we got another in California. And they're just appearing everywhere. Like earthquakes, we noticed even the Capitol buildings moved out of its place and moved back. And, and down here in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, the swimming pool there dashed the waters out from Plumbrum, Alaska. Over in Switzerland, Sweden, and through there, shook buildings and things around the world. I believe that it's trying to open our eyes to see the hour that we're living I'm here in godly fear that it may be sooner than we think of his appearing. And brethren, sister, even to the young folks, let's put all the sincerity we can. This might be the last revival we'll ever can. And we may not get through this one until he's coming. I'm looking for him today. If he isn't here today, I'll be looking for him tomorrow if I'm here. And uh, I've been looking for him now since I heard about him returning. And that's been 33 years ago when I gave my heart to him. I've been behind the pulpit 33 years, trying to proclaim his 
unsearchable riches of His glory. And I trust that God will make Himself so known among us that every unbeliever will be saved and all the sick will be healed. And the saints of the Lord, His believing children, will be lifted up in the, in the Spirit. A revival doesn't mean getting new members. It's reviving that, what we've already got. See, it's reviving. I stood some time ago and watching the waves on Lake Michigan, seeing, standing out there after a great revival in Chicago, I seen the, the waves, how they were coming in, just in the great tides just sweeping in and out. And I thought, you know, it reminded me of the song, Floods of Joy Over My Soul Like the Sea Billows Roll. And them waves uh, start somewhere out into the lake or in the ocean. And as they come, they build up momentum all the time. Then finally they strike the shore just to go out to come in again. And that's the way the waves of God's glory does. It comes in just like, uh, just like uh, rolls over and over, back and back and back and forth. The waves of the joy of God rolls through our souls. And I wondered, what was the use of that? What is the use of churning the waters up and down? Nature has a way of taking care of itself. Just like people. Now, when you're in your church with your pastors, when you're having a Sunday school lesson or, or something in your church, maybe there's no excitement going on or, or nothing unusual, but yet there's just as much God in your heart as there is when you're jumping up and down or shouting. I thought, what do they do it? Same reason God has a revival is the same reason He puts a revival on the ocean. What's a revival in the lake? If the water churning up and down takes all the trash out of the water, throws it up on the bank. And I think that's a good thing that we have revivals. They kind of get all the superstitions away from us and all the, the, the world out, churning it out, throwing it out on the bank so the waters uh, can be free of such. Now, tonight, kind of uh, the first time I've ever been here, and yet I don't feel like I'm a stranger among you. I, I'm not. I'm your brother. And I, and I uh, of course, the newness of just knowing each other, probably some of you I know I've never seen, perhaps you've never seen me, and there's always that little tight feeling that you just, it's hard, and uh, we just, it's just that way. I, everywhere I'm making, starting on my eighth trip around the world, and I, I, I find it everywhere, no matter where you are, but when you find Christian people and where the Holy Spirit is, no matter what nation, how far in the jungle or whatever it is, they do the same thing you do when you receive the Holy Ghost. They do just the same thing. They have the same liberty. They do. They believe the same way and act the same way that any Christian does when he receives Christ. But in there you find that tightness. And I think the first night is a good time just to kind of get acquainted. And then, uh, now, then as the, the meeting progresses and goes on, then we'll get more acquainted with each other than what we are now. But the uh, quicker we get out of it, well, the better off we'll be. The Holy Spirit is timid, very, very timid. And, and where you have just a one unbeliever or a skeptic sitting around, the Holy Spirit just can't work hard. You remember Jesus led a man come out of the city to heal him one time to get him away from unbelief. He come into his own city, and the Bible said in many mighty works he could not do. We don't want to think it that way, but the Bible said he couldn't do it. He, he cannot do nothing against your belief. You've got to believe it. Someone has told me many times, said, Brother Bram, I don't care what would happen, I don't believe it. Well, it wasn't to that person. It's not to unbelievers. It's only to believers, they that believe. All things are possible to them that believe. Unbelievers get nothing. And so they, they just don't believe nothing, so they get nothing. If they just got a cold theology, that's what they get. But those who believe in God and believe that Jesus Christ is just as real today as he ever was, that's what they receive. Amen. It's according to your faith, be it unto you. And then, in here, I thought I'd give tonight what we try to do. Now, I presume, being that this is Pentecostal uh, sponsored, and most in here are Pentecostal people. And that's where I throw my life. Although I never did join any Pentecostal church, no certain church, I don't have any denomination, certain denomination, and frankly, I'm not very much for it. They can have whatever they want to, but you draw lines. You see, and God, God don't like lines built in His church. It reminds me of, of a fellow one time had some ducks, and he 
He cut their wings so they couldn't fly out of a pen. He had some ducks on one side, ducks on the other. Water began to come in. The first thing you know, the water got higher and higher. The ducks got together. Uh, that's what we need to do. Let the waters go rise, and, and then the ducks get together. You see that? And we're all in the same water. <clears throat> so denominational barriers can be floated out if we just let the waters get deep enough. Like a man had a corn field. A fellow kept saying he had one field, plants off this way, another one this way. And so a fellow flying over every morning would look at that corn field. He said, isn't that a fine corn field here and one there? As the corn got a little higher, it reached all the way across the fence. It looked like one field. So I hope it gets that way here, that we're one great big heart-to-heart uh, corn field for God's kingdom. Amen. Now, our purpose. Now, many times people say, Brother Branham, the divine healer. No, that is wrong. There's only one healer, and that's God. There's no medicine that's a healer, no doctor that's a healer. There's no good doctor that claims to be a healer. And if he does, then he, he's, he's telling you something wrong. I was interviewed at Mayo Brothers, and they said, We do not profess to heal the sick, Mr. Brandon. We only profess to assist nature. There's one healer, that's God. And how sensible that is. You could break your arm, a doctor could set it, but he could heal it. Because he has nothing to heal. It has to build tissue. You, a doctor might pull a tooth out or cut a pendic out, but who's going to heal? See, the Bible isn't wrong. The Bible's right in every word. I'm the Lord who heals all of thy disease. Amen. All. No other, no, fa- they found nothing yet that would build tissue. They find medicines that they can poison germs until, until the tissue knits together, but it takes God to heal. God is the only healer that there is. So the Bible is perfectly true. And that's what we stand on, the Bible. It must be, thus saith the Lord. Now, we do believe that God can do things that's not written in His Word because He's God. He does whatever He wishes. But yet, I like to see anything when it comes in the line of a doctrine come out of the Bible. Because I believe that the Bible is the full revelation of Jesus Christ. The Bible says that's what it is. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Nothing is to be added to it or anything taken from it. So I like to stay right into what it says and what it promises. If he just knew what he promised, that's all I care to see anyhow. And I know I'll see him. Now, in this, we do not try to say we major in divine healing because divine healing is a minor and you can never major on a minor. But about 86%, I think it's estimated, of Jesus' ministry was on divine healing. He, as Dr. Bosworth used to say, my, one of my associates that just went to glory last few years, about, being about 84 years old, he said, divine healing is a bait that's on a fish hook. And you never show the fish the hook, you show him the bait. So he takes the bait and gets the hook. So that's, that's what it is. We want to catch the fish for the Lord's glory. Catch him out of the world and bring him into the kingdom of God. And so divine healing, the main thing is divine healing of the soul. The body of Christ. It means healing worse than anything that I know of is the body of Christ. It's been so broken up by man's theology and denominational differences until it's a sick body. And I, and I tell you, it it's, uh, needs healing, great healing. So I, I trust that the Lord will do a great thing towards the healing. of It's part of the body that's in here. We believe that there is one, one church. And we never join it. Next Monday, I'll be 55 years old. And the Branham family never did ask me to join their family. I was born to Branham. (laughs) That's how how I am. Uh, That's how we're Christians. We're born a Christian. And you don't join it. You're born into it. Then you take the character of Christ. Now, we find also that in this, many people here in America, especially, that's been taught, we have the system, or the, the Lord commanded it, so it's good, of laying hands upon the sick and praying for them. That was the last commission to the church. And that's very good. And it's been carried out down through the ages. Every time a revival broke out in any age, there was divine healing with it. And the supernatural of God. And now we find in this age, am I trying, what I'm trying to achieve is this. There's been so much in this last day of people who preaching divine healing has put so much self-glory in it Amen. that it's given it a bad taste before the public. Amen. <clears throat> it's been, bless the Lord, brother so-and-so laid hands on me and praise the Lord, I got healed. Now, if I could just omit that, 
If somebody could say, the Lord Jesus made me well, how much better that would be, you see. So, with the little ministry that the Lord has given me, is trying to bring him into your presence that you would lay your hands on him, your sacrifice, and be healed. It isn't so much of laying hands, which we do. We all, we pray and lay hands on the sick. We don't heal the people. They're already healed. Every person is already healed. How many believe that? Now, let's see how our congregation has been taught. It's two-thirds of them believe it anyhow. Now, uh, that he was wounded for our transgression. With his stripes, we were healed. Every attribute that he died for at Calvary is ours from that time on. Everything that he died for. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquity, chastised our peace up on him with the stripes we were healed. We were healed. Past tense. Every sinner is saved. From the day that Jesus died on the cross, he forgave every sin of man. Now God is a great, a great, like a great being in the beginning. God. He, we, he wasn't even God to begin with. God is an object of worship. And he was called, there was nothing to worship. He was self-existence, Elohim. And there was nothing to worship him. When he created angels, then there was something to worship him. But in this great God, Elohim, was attributes. There was attributes in there to be God. Attributes to be Father. Attributes to be Son. Attributes to be Savior. Attributes to be Healer. All these attributes was in God. And if you've ever got eternal life, you were in God's attributes because you got eternal life. Jesus came as Redeemer, and redeem means bring it back to where it started from. Amen. Right. You were in God's thinking. He might have to breathe this with that and down here and down here like a man making chimes for the church. Puts in so much brass and so much iron and gets it just to the right pitch. The molder knows how to put it in. If he doesn't, he doesn't get the right ring. And God knows just exactly where you belong, what age you belong in. And therefore, if you got eternal life, the word eternal is something never did begin or never can end. Yeah. So whoever you were, see, you were, you always were. You were God's attribute did display. A, a word, in the beginning was a word, and the word is a thought made manifest. You think it, then speak it. Like I'd say, the light. I had to think light before it said light. Microphone, have to say it. Think microphone, but say it. Microphone. And we are God's attributes displayed. And I find out, I find two classes of people as I go along. One of them is the fundamentalists, and the other is Pentecostals. Now, the Pentecostals got something, but they don't know who they are. And the fundamentalists know something, but they ain't got nothing with it. So now there, it's just like a man's got money in a bank and can't write a check, and the other can write a check and got no money in the bank. If you could ever get that thing together, it would, it would be a great thing. But now, in the face of this, the way we try to carry the meeting is for you, you as an individual, for your need in Christ, salvation, divine healing, or whatever you have need of, is to by faith know that you're in the presence of Christ, and by faith you reach and get it. For that's the only way you'll ever get it, is by faith we are saved, by faith we're healed. See, nothing that God has to come down and do again, he's already done it. So you see, the whole thing is, is God becoming tangible. That on the great days that's to come, when Christ sets up on the throne of David and reigns in the millennium, it's God tangible in the earth. He is now in you. You are his attributes. If you've got eternal life, your life always was. And you was God's thinking, the color of hair, whatever you are, you was God's thinking and you're just materialized. And that's what God was when he was materialized in Christ. God displayed, manifested in flesh. In Christ, he became material God that we could touch. 1 Timothy 3.16, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness, for God was manifested in the flesh. See? It was God being manifested, getting ready. Now, here we are in this form. Still we're negative, like taking a picture of something and snapping it. God says... He'll have dark hair, blue eyes, and so forth. It'll be this, that, the other. The picture snaps. The age of about 20 years old, 22. Then death sets in. You start dying down. No matter how much you eat, 
how well you put food back into your body and make blood cells, you're dying. And there's not a scientist in the world can explain it. You pour water out of a jug into a glass and it gets half full, then you just keep pouring and it goes down. How about that? The food you eat makes blood cells. Blood cells build your body. Every time you eat, you renew your life. When you were one year old, on up, on up, till you got about 22, and then now you're eating the same food. I'm eating the same food I did at 16. At 16, every time I eat, it built muscles and big and strong. I got my full matured. And then after fully matured, I'm eating the same food and better and more of it. And I'm getting older and weaker all the time. But every time I renew my life, then I wouldn't have to die. See? But God has made an appointment. And man must die and face the judgment. And you're going to keep that appointment, friends. Just remember that. And while we're here tonight, we want to remember those things. That we've got to meet that appointment. There might be many you'll stand up and get away from, but that's one we're sure everyone to meet. And now, in that... It's an appointment that God has made with man. This body must, because it is yet negative, it's subject to death. So he gets the eternal spirit, his attribute displayed in that body. Then like any picture in its negative form, it goes into the dark room. There it's developed. It comes out to the perfect picture. And we go into the dark room. But to come out at the negative has been a perfect picture in the image of Christ. We go into the dark grave, into the dark room for developing. It takes death to develop it. Just like it takes death to yourself to develop the picture of the image of Christ, the life of Christ in you. You have to dump your own out so that Christ can come in. You have to die to yourself. So does your physical being die to be formed and molded into the image of Him. But you're still that attribute. It cannot be destroyed. It can never be destroyed. It's God in the beginning. It's God above us, God with us, God in us. Amen. And it's all the attributes of God, eternal life to the sons of man. Now, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray tonight that you will bless us and get glory out of our gathering together. We dedicate this building and the grounds placing ourselves upon it and giving it to you as an offering, Lord, for the honor of your name. Grant it, Lord. Bless everything that we do. May it be to honor Jesus Christ and to bring him a living reality among the people. And when the service is finished and we depart from these meetings to go to our homes, may we say like those who some 19 years ago, this last Easter, when they was coming from Emmaus, when he appeared among them and did the same thing that he did before his crucifixion. He was the risen Lord because he was still making himself known in the same things that he did before his crucifixion. And their eyes were open and they recognized him. God, may we say tonight, after 1900 years, when we're on our road back home tonight, may we say, did not our hearts burn within us as he spoke to us along the way? May he identify himself tonight among us, Lord, as a risen Lord, ready to return for his church. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Each night, in order to keep the thing orderly, we have come to be prayed for. Brother Borders, are, are my son, Billy Paul, one of them, will be here every evening about, uh, about uh, an hour before be services begin. And they bring down little cards. It's got numbers on them. This boy will take these cards and mix them up right in before you, see. So that, and then give you a card, whatever one you want. When I come down at night, each night, that gives a newcomer each day uh, a chance to get a prayer card. Then each night, not too many will get on the platform at a time. But I'll bring up so many to be prayed for. Might come to start from... Uh, one therefore it shows that the boy who gives out the cards cannot guarantee you anything or sell a prayer card to you to show you, you go get in the prayer line you got the same chance because the cards are mixed up before the audience another thing is that I might start from any place I might start from 50 to come backwards from 30 to go forward or from just sometimes I count how many is in this row and divide it by this row and so forth like that to get a number and sometimes take a little kid and Judge about his age or some man or woman or something like that. You know, or just anything comes in my mind. Therefore, there's no one knows where the prayer line starts. And that gives every person a chance. Then at the end, all together we pray for every person that holds a card. So we just hold your card. 
Now, many times in the meetings that people don't even get to the platform, if anybody here has ever been in the meeting before, there's 10 out there healed from one's healed platform. It takes faith, no matter where it is, you've got to meet that faith, that's all. And faith is not just a, a myth, just something you imagine, it's something you know. Amen. And now, uh, I'm going to ask you now, as we turn now for the scripture reading tonight, we're going to read out of the book of... Um, out of the book of Hebrews tonight. And now, when we uh, stand uh, to read the word, we stand when we pledge allegiance to the flag and we, we stand in honor of all of our national emblems and so forth. So let's stand while we read the word of God, will you? <laughs> Hebrews, the 13th chapter, the 1 to 8 verse. Let brotherly love continue. Be not entertained strangers. For thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Remember them that are in bonds, as bonds with them, and them which are adversity, as being yourself also in the body. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Let your conversations be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. So that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversations. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Let's bow our heads. Lord Jesus, make this a reality to us tonight. Not just the reading of a word, but may the word become flesh among us. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. <laughs> As we speak just for a few moments, and each night we're going to try to be out by 9.30 if, uh, if possible. I want to thank my sponsors again and the people. Let us have the, the place here, the grounds, the stock exhibit or whatever it is. We're very thankful. Now, uh, you're just a nice group to talk to, and I can just talk a long time, but uh, I don't want to weary you. Each night, about 30 minutes, tonight will be a little longer because of being the first night. I want to speak on the subject tonight of the identified Christ of all ages because the Bible says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever in the identity of Christ in all ages. Now, did you notice here the scripture saying here that remember those who have rule over you considering their conversations, you see, at the end of their conversations is Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. So many people... I have different opinions of Christ. As I travel in, in different parts of the country and around the world, I find that so many people have their different opinions. You'd be surprised to know what some of their opinions are. Some of them think that he's just a wonderful teacher. Well, uh, he, was, uh, he was that. That's just exactly. And many think that he was a great philosopher, which he was that. He Certainly he was. And then um, some of them uh, think that he was a, a good man. He, he was that. But see, he was more than that. He was all of that plus. Some of them think that he was a prophet. He was a prophet. But he was more than a prophet. He was what the prophets was plus. See? So uh, what, how would we know now uh, if his teaching, uh, 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 of his teachings, he was a teacher and he was a great philosopher, but the, the only way that we'll ever know today, if we wanted to identify him today, and uh, I believe that he raised from the dead, I believe that with all my heart, yes. and I believe that he's promised here that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and I am with thee always, and I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. Amen. Now, those words, are they're either true or they're not true. Yes. And if they're not true, then what are we doing here tonight? We are, we are wretched people. We're people that's, uh, that's, well, we are deceived. The whole Christian world is deceived if he isn't the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he isn't alive tonight and with us, 
as he promised. Lo, I'm with you always, even to the consummation or the end of the world. I'm with you always. Now, if that isn't the truth, then uh, there's something wrong. And we're, we are found false witnesses. Not only are we making ourselves miserable under a false pretense, but we're deceiving others. We're found deceivers of something we're talking about, which isn't. If he's just a myth or he's just a historical, what good is a historical Christ if he isn't the same today? What good is a God of Moses if he isn't the same God today? What good does it do to take your your canary bird and feed him uh, fine uh, vitamins to make him have pretty feathers and good strong wings and keep him in a cage? See, it doesn't do him any good. And we talk about how great God was and then don't say he's the same today, then there's something wrong. We're caged up somewhere. Amen. And that, that's, a, that's a false conception of what God is. The Bible plainly says he's the same. And that means he's the same. He's just as he was. He hasn't changed one bit. And he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And now we have today in this day and time just like they did in his day and in all days. We have our own thought of it. But surely, if there's any way in the world that we would truly know, we will have to find out what he was and then find out what he was in other ages. You remember, the Bible said he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So we'll have to find what he is out of other ages to know what he was in the age that he walked on earth the age before he walked on earth and the age after he was on earth and left the earth. We'll have to find out what he was to know what he is today. Yes. Always, because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, but uh, and otherwise, we'll have to go back and search out to see whatever he was. Now, we find out in St. John, the first chapter, beginning with the first verse, it says, In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. Now, that's the attributes, His words. Their thoughts now, they're not expressed. See? In the beginning is, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. In the beginning was the Word. Well, if He was the Word in the beginning, He's the Word today. Because He always is the Word. Now, God's got to judge the world by something. And people say, well, now, as, um, uh, if I'd ask the Catholic here tonight, what do you think that God will judge the world by? The Catholic saved by the Catholic Church. All right, now, what Catholic Church? Now, they got the Roman, the Greek Orthodox, and many of them. Which Catholic Church would it be? The Lutheran saved by us, then you Baptists are out. And then if it's saved by the Baptists, then you Pentecostals are out. So there'd be such a confusion, no one would know what to do. So he never promised to judge the world by the church. He promised to judge the world by Christ. And Christ is the Word. And the Bible is what will judge the world, which is Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, if he was in the beginning, he lauded his Word so much for each generation. Each time that he he had this age coming on, he's omnipresent, omnipotent, omnipotent, and infinite. If he isn't, he isn't God. Being infinite, he's, he's, he's eternal. And then in that, being omnipresent, being omnipotent, knowing all things, make the same omnipresent. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So therefore, he could tell the end from the beginning. And in each age, he lauded so much of his word. In each age. And then, usually, man gets it so twisted up, and the world gets in such a shape, until he has to send some man anointed. All ages has been the same. He identifies himself upon the earth in man. God does nothing without man. The Bible said so. See? He always takes man, because it was man he had to use and let the man put him on a free moral agency, knowing that he would fall in order to display his attributes as a Savior, for there was nothing lost. And therefore, he chose man. He could have chose stars. He could have chose uh, trees. But he chose man. One time, standing looking up on the harvest, Jesus, he said, the harvest is ripe. 
The labors are few. Pray the Lord of the harvest to send labors into his harvest. And he was the Lord of the harvest. Yeah. See? You have not because you ask not. You ask not because you believe not. Ask abundance that your joys might be full. Amen. See? He's depending on you asking and believing that you receive what you ask for. Yeah. Now, then in the beginning we find out that he allotted his word. We find out in the days of Moses and all down through that he, he identifies himself each time by his prophets. The Bible says he does nothing till first he reveals it to his prophets. And remember, God is unchangeable God. Amen. He never changes. He remains the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Now we find out in each age that man gets into God's program. They draw up their own mind and it looks good. It looks good, very fine, and sometimes it's so close it might be one word different. But that one word means the difference between death and life. Amen. It was one word to start this whole ball rolling. When Eve disbelieved one phase of God's word. Remember, she, Satan didn't just kind of uh, throw the whole thing off. He said, oh, surely this will be this way and this is that way and God and so and so. But surely he won't do this. But he said he would do it. And when he said he would do it, that makes it so. Amen. See, just you must believe every phase of it. No matter what it says, believe it anyhow. Amen. If you can't explain it, believe it anyhow. Amen. You cannot explain God. No one can. Amen. God is known by faith, not by science. Amen. You believe God by faith because he said so. Yes. And that settles it as long as he said it so. That cures the case. Yes. He said so. Don't make any difference how much science says it's not. Noah couldn't explain how water was up in the sky because science said there was none there. But if God said so, he's able to put water up there. So that, that settled it. He just believed God. Always the man who's anointed with the word believes what God said regardless of whether he can prove it or not. He believes it anyhow. God does approve it. Listen, today we're always like, man is always praising God for what he done. Always looking forward for what he will do and ignoring what he's doing. It's always been that same thing. And everybody's got his own private interpretation. God is his own interpreter. God don't need no one to interpret. The Bible said it's without interpretation. It don't need man. God interprets the Bible himself. God said, let there be light. And there was light. That settles it. God said, a virgin shall conceive. And she did. That settled it. When God says anything and vindicates it, that's his interpretation of it. He said he poured out his spirit in this last days, and he did it. There's no interpretation to it. It's already interpreted. Unbelievers might rise, and skeptics might stand, and whatever they might do, but God did it anyhow because he said he would do it. He doesn't need anybody to interpret him. He does his own interpretation. He made the promise. People leave it. He interprets it to them. He's the Lord who heals all of our diseases. I can't tell you how he does it, but he does it. He said he would do it. And he would do it. So up to our faith. He couldn't do it there without faith. Neither can he do it here or any time without faith. Now, he is the word. He's the word identified for that age. Now, the trouble with people today, we find them living in the glare of another age. Just like Jesus found when he come. He found them living in the glare of the law and ignoring what was to take place in his age. You know, what's the matter today? What's the matter with the... What was the matter with the Lutheran? Well, because they were living in the glare of the Lutheran age when John Wesley found the secret of sanctification. They couldn't go. Because they were living in the glare of Luther's age. What happened to the Pentecostals? While Wesley was so organized until he was living in the glare of another age they was not Wesley's age when the baptism of the Holy Ghost fell upon the Pentecostals. See, they were living what Wesley said, sanctification. It was hard for them to believe the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the restoration of the gifts. They're living in the glare of another age. That's what they were doing when Jesus comes. We have Moses. We, we have Moses. He said, if you'd have known Moses, you'd know me. Moses wrote on me. Search the scriptures for in them. You think you have eternal life. And there are they that testify me. That was a scripture that was supposed to be God identifying, interpreting his scripture for that age. And it's always Christ. It's Christ in every age. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's always been Christ. Now we find out that now we find our Pentecostal brethren are living in the glare of a Pentecostal age. And they still miss it. They're trying to interpret a Pentecostal age when we're plumb past that. 
We're living on up to the rapture in time for the coming of the, the end time. But that's the way man does. It's just uh, be that way. We got so much that's allotted to each age and the Bible is allotted out that way and that's the way we have to have it. That's where it has to be. The unchangeable God with the unchangeable character and his characteristics remain just the same. He cannot change his characteristic. He cannot do it. Anything is known by its characteristic. I don't know if you all have yellow hammers down here or not. J, we call them thicker. And a, a jaybird. They're both about the same size. You watch a jaybird flying. If he's in a distance and you watch him, he'll make a beeline when he's flying. But a yellow hammer, he'll go up and down as he flies. See, that's a characteristic of the yellow hammer. You can tell him by his action. Watch a man use his right or left hand. He's a care. We got women today that wants to be man. They dress like them, but they're still, watch them walk and what they do. They're still, their characteristic shows that they're women, yet it's the same. See, because it's just that way. We'll get to that later. But, uh, however, we're on something else. Right now, remember, you're identified by characteristic, and God is identified by his great characteristic that he cannot change. Amen. He said in Malachi 3, 6, I am God and I change not. Amen. He absolutely doesn't change. His characteristics are the same. Each time he appeared on the earth at the end of an age, he always sent a man and anointed him with the Holy Ghost. Christ, the Holy Ghost is Christ. The anointed, the Logos. And it went out. And it comes to identify the, the words of that age. The word of the Lord comes to the prophets. The Bible said so. And identifies that age. See? He does nothing outside of man. Now, he can't do it in a group. You can't do it. It just never has been done. He never did use a group. Never did. He uses one single person. You're not... Israel was saved as a nation. But you're going to be saved as an individual. One person he deals with. He had a... He didn't even have a... Uh, a Moses and Elijah at the same time. He couldn't have Elijah and Elias at the same time. He couldn't have John and Jesus at the same time. He's always got one because he gets that one person into his divine will. If we started tonight and I got one man, some man here that I pick out, we agree on doctrine just perfectly. We'd start a little group. In a year from the day, we'd have so many Rickies in there, why, well, it'd be a shame. That's right. Yeah, they just come in like parasites. You can't keep them out. So therefore, it never was God's system. God cannot change. He deals same. One individual. He did it through the ages. He's always done it. And his characteristic is identified to that age. Now, don't forget that. His characteristic is identified in that age. Look at the days of Joseph, the prophet. How that Jesus was perfectly identified in Joseph. He was born, loved of his father, hated of his brethren. Without a cause. He loved his brothers, but they were self-starched Pharisee-like, and they had nothing to do with him and hated him because he saw visions and, and so forth. But the very characteristic in him showed that it was Christ. Amen. Joseph was a prophet. He foretold the things that happened just exactly the way that it happened. When he spoke it, that's the way it happened. And he interpreted dreams, and he'd never just give a wild interpretation of it. Every time he said it would be that way, that's just the way it was. He was born a prophet for that age. Exactly right. Now we find that God displayed his characteristic in Joseph. Every one of the prophets displayed God's characteristic because he picked up the word for that age and identified it. God interpreted his word of that age through the man. Now no one can find fault with that. That's the scripture. Well, if it always has been that way... Won't it have to be the same today if he's the same yesterday, today, and forever? God interpreted his own word. He said this thing will happen at a certain age and this thing will happen. And he comes down and does it. Now, I don't need no interpret into it because it does itself. He doesn't need anyone to interpret him. He's Elohim. The self-existing, all-sufficient. He needs no help from nobody. See, he's God. And he does as he will. And there's one thing that we are sure that he can't do. He can't go against his word. Amen. And remain God. He has to keep his word. Because the word is God. Amen. And God is identified through his promised word at an age. In, a certain, in the days of... Now what in the days of Moses? He was identified. He was identified because he was identified by his word. He told Abraham, Your seed will sojourn in a strange land for 400 years. I'll bring him out with a mighty hand. Now... 
When this great big sign happened as a big ball of fire in a burning bush, Moses was a chemist. He was taught in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. What if Moses would have went by with his, with his educational uh, stand and said, look at that funny tree. It's on fire. It's burning. The leaves are popping and there's nothing being destroyed, being consumed. Now, if that gets through burning, I'll pick some of the leaves and go out to the laboratory and find out what kind of a chemical it's been sprayed with. It had never talked to him. But when he took off his shoes, walked up humbly, that's the way we find God. When we take off our pride and lay it down and walk up in the presence. Listen to that voice that about, I am that I am. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Jacob. I remember my promise and I see the condition is right. I Come down and I'm going to speak and I'm sending you and you'll be my voice. Oh my, that's the way he does it. What did he do it? By identifying himself and his characteristic in the supernatural. The supernatural sometimes is so phenomenal. It gets plumb away from the people. The people get to be good people, nice people. But sometimes they misunderstand. That's what, that was the same thing with Joseph. He couldn't understand. He's a son of David. But he couldn't understand how that Mary could conceive. Now, no doubt with them big, pretty brown eyes looked into his face and said, uh, Honey, I know we're engaged to be married. I've got something to tell you. I've had a visit by Gabriel, and I'm, I've conceived uh, by the Holy Spirit, he told me. And uh, this thing is going to be born. Will not be your son. It'll be the Son of God. And now, Joseph wanted to believe that. But he, he just couldn't believe it hardly. It's too hard for him to believe. But, you know, it was unusual. Uh, women didn't conceive virginly, so it was unusual. And that's the unusual things that God does. It stumbles the people. Yeah. It brightens, opens the eyes of some and blinds the others yeah. at the same time. It's always did that. He, he the unusual things, an unusual way. If Joseph would have only looked in the Scripture to find out what was to take place in that day. Yeah. Now, there was no prophets then. They hadn't had a prophet for 400 years. Malachi was their last prophet. And prophets were very unusual. So they had no prophets in them days. So God took secondarily and gave him a dream and told him, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not taking thee, marry thy wife, for that which is conceived of her in her is of the Holy Ghost. See, God identifying himself. He always does that in the way of the supernatural. Now these Joseph and Moses, and we just have plenty of time. We can just go on and on with it. But you understand what I mean, that God in every age always sends a individual. One person. So why do you hang on to some group when they're all together wrong? The Bible said so. Revelation 17 and all be collected in one great group. But out of there will come individuals. That's right with God. Not the group right. The individual right. The individual in the group. Now... We find out then we fuss and go on about we belong to this and we belong to that. That don't mean one thing to God. Amen. It's you as an individual before God. It, you've got to stand on your own feet. You're the one that has to make the testimony. Amen. Each one of you has to do that. answer to God for the revelation. Now what if I'm speaking here to a person that was actually cannot receive it. There's nothing in him to receive from. The Bible said she that lives in pleasure is dead while she's alive. Why was it those Pharisees? Look at Jesus. All that we know, he was a manifested word of God. We believe that. The Bible said it was. Well, watch when he done his Messiah sign. The Pharisees that had a little bit of light, there's good people, lived a good Christian life or a good religious life, had a little light about them. They had organized in a priesthood. They had a little light, but down in the bottom of their heart, they had no eternal representation in glory. So when they seen that supernatural done, they said, this man's Beelzebub, the devil. And what happened? That put what light they had out. Yeah. But here was a little ill-famed woman, a prostitute. Down in her heart was she had a representation of one of God's thoughts. There she was, waited in sin. But when she seen that happen, she said, Sir, I believe you're a prophet. I don't know when the Messiah cometh. He'll tell us he's saying, what did he do? He cleansed her life. He was a redeemer to her because he could lift her up. Where she come from with this Pharisee? Think of it, religious as he could be. And Jesus said, you are of your father, the devil, and his works you'll do. Amen. Religious Amen. man, belong to fine high orders. And Jesus called them snakes in the grass and devils. They rejected the light of the hour. That's exactly what it was. Jesus in his age 
What was it? Just like the prophets of their age. Each one of them was God's word being interpreted for that age. Moses was God's word interpreted. God said, I'll send down there and I'll deliver him. I'm sending you down with my word. I'll do great signs and wonders. He did it. Mary, she was God's word interpreted. A virgin shall conceive. That was God's word interpreted. Now here comes Jesus on the scene, the God of the prophets. And here they were so organized and discriminated and all in such a condition till they couldn't even, they didn't even recognize him. He didn't come the way they thought he ought to come. They thought God would pull a little lever here and let the quarters of heaven down and he'd walk out and say, Cephasus, high priest of God, I have arrived. But he had a baby born in a manger down in a, a little cave stable in Bethlehem. Way down there with the straw and manure of the barn. A little baby wrapped in swaddling cloth and laid into a manger. Had no schooling. Watch how the corrected the word is. He was the word. He is the word. He ever remains the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, I'm not making any throwing off anything to anybody or anything. That's not my purpose to do that. That's my heart. I get around from this altar and get right first. But look, you people who pray to Mary for an intercessor. Look at Mary. I believe she was a virgin woman, certainly, but she's just an incubator that God used to bring Christ to the earth. The house that God stretched his tent from being Jehovah to be man. He was Emmanuel, God dwelling among us, camping with us. God handled in the flesh. God housed in a tent called a man. That was the Son of God. Look at Mary. Here's a boy, 12 years old. Never had a day in school as we know of. Here he is standing in the temple debating with the priest. Watch, here comes his father and mother three days and nights and missed him. And they found him in the temple. They said, son, we have sought... Mary, listen, Mary said, we, your father and I have sought you day and night with tears. Look at there. Denied her testimony. She told Joseph that the Holy Ghost overshadowed her. She told those priests that this is a virgin-born baby. And here she stands and say, your father, Joseph, and I. See how incorrect that is? But watch the Word of God. Said, know you not that I must be about my father's business? The Word always corrects the error by identifying God among them. Twelve-year-old child. If he'd been, uh, Joseph been his father, had been building houses and cabinets. But he's out there tearing down that denominations of that day. He was about his father's business. See what he was doing? I know you not that I must be about my father's business? See? Told his mother. See how that? He was the Word. He is the Word. And the Word corrects the error by the identifying of God's characteristic. Amen. Look, when the world... I can imagine Simon Peter. I read a little story once of him and, and uh, his brother Andrew. And his name was Simon then, you know, and he hadn't been called Peter yet. So him and his brother was uh, fishers with their father. And they was out on the sea, and the old man is getting old, and he called him to the boat one night. He said, boys, you know, we have trusted God many times that we had have nothing to eat and have bills to pay, and, and we go out without a catch for two or three days, and your mother and I, before you, she went away while we'd all gather around and pray and God would give us a good catch. Boys, I've trusted God all my life. And I always live like any true Hebrew to see the Messiah coming. Now, boys, I, I'm getting too old now. I probably won't see him. But I want you boys well instructed. He see him put his arms around Simon and one around Andrew and said, Boys, just before he's coming, you'll see a flare. There'll be all kinds of false things raised up sort of just blind the eyes of the people. Always does that. And it did just that. There'd be all kinds of... But remember, don't you be deceived. The Messiah will be a prophet. Because Moses said in Deuteronomy, the 18th chapter and the 15th verse, the Lord your God shall raise up a prophet like unto me. Now, we haven't had any prophets to manifest the word of God. There's been none of them here for the word to come to. So we've just had a denominational affair for hundreds and hundreds of years. But when that one arrives on the scene, don't you be deceived. He'll be a prophet. The Lord shall make himself known. He'll be a prophet. And when he comes, he'll identify himself as a prophet. I can imagine one day that Simon going down to see Jesus there at the shore. And when he walked up into the presence of Jesus, Jesus looked at him and said, just started his ministry now, St. John, the first chapter. And after the word is made flesh and dwelt among us, here he is. Now, 
We told him, Andrew seen him first and heard John preach and tried to get Simon to go. And he just said, oh, well, it's just another preacher. Let it go. And there's been this, that, or the other. But first thing you know, they thought they'd come see. He said, now the Messiah has arrived. Oh, and uh, Simon couldn't believe that. So he just walked up one day to where Jesus was standing. Jesus was standing down on the lake that morning and all the people had gathered up and the women washed the dishes real quick, set their clothes back and everything. They wouldn't wash that day. Come down to hear him speak. Simon was signed all night there and he probably caught no fish or nothing. He walked around and thought, I believe we'll just hear what he says. He walked up to him. He's an odd looking sort of a fellow. The Bible said there's no beauty we should desire him. He didn't look like a king. Beauty is of the devil. Always. That's exactly right. And uh, we we'll, might get to that a little later on. So then... Find out, we see what Cain offered and see what it was in heaven and find out what this world vain beauty is and what Hollywood's tuck over today, even the church. Amen. Yes, sir, it's a false conception of the devil. Amen. You'll miss the beauty of the Lord and holiness and power, Amen. not in paint and power and shorts and everything else that they're trying to wear. No. It's in beauty of the holiness and righteousness. We are out of this world. We're from a kingdom that's above. For God, the righteousness of God. They want to adorn themselves with that. Too much television and so forth. So then we find that Simon walked up into his presence and there stood the one that Andrew believed to be the Messiah. And as Jesus, as soon as he looked at, at Simon, he said, Your name is Simon and you're the son of Jonas. <laughs> he knew then who that was. <laughs> there was the old joke that there was God identified again right here in the scripture, his same characteristic. Yeah. If Joseph could just look back there and see that. Jesus, when he was preaching here on earth, he said, he said, search the scriptures. In them you think you have eternal life. They are the ones that testify of me. If they just to turn back away from the law, the law was from that day. And they were living in that kind of a glare. But here they are today. They couldn't see the scripture identified right there. Amen. And they failed to see it. And they've done it in every age. And they'll do it in this one too. Amen. Nothing else for them to do that's been predicted they would. So they, they'll do it. There's no way of getting around it. The lady of the age will do the same thing. Now, watch him there. He stood there and he said, Now, we haven't had a prophet for 400 years. And here's the man who tells me who I am and who my godly father was. That's the Messiah. Now, we are told that Simon was an ignorant and unlearned man, but he was made the head of the church. Yeah. We find out there was one standing there by the name of, of Philip. And he saw that and he'd have Bible studies with a man named, uh, named Nathaniel. And if you'll mark where Jesus was, the where he found Nathaniel is 15 miles. That's a good day's journey. So he must have run around there, the, around the hill like that. Now we're going to see. He said, Nathaniel, when he met him, he said, you know, we've been having Bible studies. Yes. Well, now, we've been believing that it's time for something to happen. The dispensations are changing. And uh, we're time for the Messiah to come because we haven't had any prophet now for 400 years. And Malachi told us that he had sent the forerunner before us, and I believe that to be John. Now, we know when you see a sign, a true Bible sign, there's a true Bible voice behind it. Yeah. If there's no voice, follows the sign. It's the same old theological voice. Forget it. It never come from God. Yeah. There's always told Moses, if they won't believe the first sign, they'll believe the voice of the second sign. There's got to be a voice with the sign. Amen. Absolutely. Amen. And if it's the same old theological voice, forget it. You already have that. It's something God's trying to attract the attention of the people by a sign and then give them the voice. What's behind the sign? Amen. Amen. Must be a scriptural voice. Moses wouldn't have believed it. Neither would Paul when he rode down to Damascus. When he seen that sign of that pillar of fire, he screamed out, Lord! That Jew would have never called anything else Lord, but Lord, but the Lord himself. He said, who are you? He said, I'm Jesus. Yeah. And it's hard. Hallelujah. Pretty kick Hallelujah. against the freak. See, there was the sign and there was the voice of the sign. Then look what he said. <laughs> look, watch his ministry from then on, what he did. Mm -hmm. And um, you'll see how to run the church. Now, we find out that there he was identifying the sign. Then we see in Nathaniel, we bring him around. And Nathaniel said, now, wait a minute. Now, you must be wrong. No, I'm not wrong. Do you know that old fisherman that we used to fish with down there? Yes. You know, he couldn't sign his name. That's right, to that receipt for the fish that time. Well, he walked up in the presence of this one. Well, I'm known to be the Messiah. Now, I want to ask you, Nathaniel, you're a good scholar, a good Hebrew, and a good reader of the Bible. What will the Messiah be when he comes? Well, he'll be a prophet. Because the Bible says, well, what would you say if I told you that he told that man, Simon, who he was and what his, who his father was? Oh, I can't believe that. Well, let's go find out. Let's go come and see. Could anything good come out of Nazareth? He said, he said, come and see. 
That's a good question. Don't stay home and criticize it. Come and see for yourself. So come bring your Bible and search it. Here he come. Could any good thing come out of Nazareth? He said, come see. And when he walked up into the presence of Jesus, Jesus looked at him. Now he said, behold an Israelite in whom there's no guile. He said, Rabbi, when did you ever know me? He said, before Philip called you, when you were under the tree, I saw you. He said, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God. Thou art the King of Israel. Why? His characteristic identifying. Why? Hebrews, the fourth chapter, the twelfth verse, says that the Word of God is more powerful, more sharper than a two-edged sword, dividing the sunner and a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's what the prophets did, and they were the Word. They were the Word in their age. But here was the fullness of the Word. See? They was the one who could tell them what happened, discern the thoughts and what was and what is and what is to come. So there he was standing there. Oh, there were, some of them stood there and said, they had to give an answer to their congregation. They had to do it because the, the, the mighty works was done and they couldn't deny it. See, they already had healing. As far as healing was concerned, they had the pool of Bethesda up there. You know, they, uh, Bethesda, they went into that pool and got healed. They had divine healing in every age. But here was a prophet. They, they had to do it. You know what they said? This man's Beelzebub, a fortune teller. He does the, Jesus said, I forgive you for that. But when the Holy Ghost comes in another age to do the same word, one well, works one word against it will never be forgiven. Amen. Not in this world or the world to come. That's blasphemy, calling the Spirit of God an unclean spirit that's doing the work of God. Amen. Think of that real hard now. Remember, keep that on your mind. Yes, that's how he was identified yesterday. That was Jesus yesterday. If he's the same today, he'd do the same. That's how he made himself known as a Messiah. That's how they know him, but that work. Look, that's, there's only three, class, three races of people. That's Jew, Gentile, and Samaritan. That's the, the Ham, Sham, and Japheth people. Now, if we believe the Bible, they all come from the sons of Noah. That's the Jew, Gentile, and Samaritan. Now, the Gentile wasn't looking for no, no uh, Messiah. We had a club on our back and worshiping a heathen god. We Anglo-Saxon and so forth in them days. We were heathens, Romans and Greeks and so forth. We wasn't looking for no Messiah. But the Hebrews was looking for it. And he, remember, get this close now. He only appears to those who are looking for him. He only appears to those who are looking for him. Makes himself known to those who are looking for him. And he made himself known to the Jews. Many times we'll get later on in the week, get more characters. But right now, now there's a Samaritan. They're looking for him too. So he was on his road down to Jericho, so he had to go up by the way of Samaria, and he come to a city, Sychar. About 11 o'clock or 12, he sent the disciples into the city to get some victuals. While they were gone, an ill-famed woman of the city came out, maybe a pretty girl. She probably, uh, you know, had been turned out by her parents and everything, and she'd seen nothing in the church, so she just made her living in a bad way by having too many husbands. And she come to the well, and there was Jesus sitting there, a Jew, He's probably looked a little older than what he really was because he's only 30. And we find out in St. John 6 that they claimed he looked like he was 50. He said, you're not over 50 years old. Say, so you've seen Abraham. He said, before Abraham was, I am. And, but it might, his work might have made a big strain on him. There he was sitting over against the wall. And this woman come up and tucked a little, you have down here in the south, a window, you know, and hooked this still old wells right there in the same way. And it's a little panoramic like. And, and she let this water pot down. You ought to see them women. You women talk about walking correct. I've seen them take them pots that hold about five gallons and they take them, put them on top of their head, one up there, put one on one hip and one on the other and walk right along talking to one another and never spill a drop. Just walk just as nice as you ever seen. Now, in the East, see, the bad women and the good women can't associate together. Uh, it's different here, but, but they can't there. She's marked, she's marked. That's all. If she ever has the wrong husband, she ain't no more associated with. But there it's all messed together here. Now, we find out, but there it wasn't. So she couldn't come with the virgins of the morning. So she had to come up about noon to get hers water. So she started to let down the water pot, but there was a predestinated seed in that little woman. She let down that water pot. She heard a man say, give me a drink. Bring me a drink. She turned and looked around. She's seen this Jew. And this Jew, maybe a middle-aged man, I don't know what was in her thoughts saying. So she said, um, uh, why, it's not customary for you uh, being a Jew and ask me a woman of Samaria. See, she didn't know what it was. What it was. She just, maybe the man's maybe getting smart with her. So he said, it's not customary for you Jews. And uh, so the conversation went on. What was he trying to do? 
He is trying to attract her attention. The father had sent him up there, but now he had to find out why up there. They were looking for a Messiah. He had done identified himself with the Jews. Now here he is with the, with the, with the Samaritans and said, uh, it's not customary for you to, to, to ask me a woman of Samaria for such. So he said, but if you knew who you were talking to, you'd ask me for a drink. I'd give you waters you don't come here to draw. And they went talk about worship. Directly he found what her trouble was. We all know what it was. Too many husbands. He looked at her and said, Woman, go get your husband and come here. She said, I don't have any husband. He said, You told the truth. Or you've got five, and the one you're living with now is not yours. Watch that woman. Look at the difference between her and that organization. Watch her as an individual. Watch those Pharisees said, This man's Beelzebub. Look at her, not her. She turned and she said, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Amen. Ah, there's that light. See, Amen. when the sun hits the seed in the right kind, it's going to bring forth life. This is sure as the world. Struck that seed in that little prostitute's heart. She said, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Now, we know it's, we have been hundreds of years since we had a prophet. And we know that when Messiah cometh, we're looking for him. And when Messiah cometh, this is the thing he's going to do. That's the sign of the Messiah, don't you see? It was the Messiah that was in Moses. It was the Messiah that was in Enoch. It was the Messiah in every age. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. It's Christ all the time. Amen. He said, I know, we know that when the Messiah cometh, that's what he's going to do. He said, I'm he that speaks to you. Yes. Oh, my. Uh, Upon that, she dropped the water pot, run into the city, and said, Come see a man who's told me what I've done. Isn't Amen. this the very Messiah? Yeah. And the people of that city, without seeing it done, the whole city believed on him. That's right. Why? His characteristic of what he was, he was identified to that city of Sychar. He was identified the Messiah of God by his character. Characteristic was in him. Because he was, he was a God of the prophets. He was the prophet. He was the prophet manifested. He's always been down through the age the same and if he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, to hurry and close, we are told in Zechariah 14, 6 and 7 that there will come a day, prophet prophesied, that you can't be called day or night. It's a gloomy, dismal, dark day. But in the evening time, it shall be light. The Bible said so. Now look, in closing, geographically, the sun rises on the eastern people first. It rises in the east and sets in the west. Now, follow me close. Civilization has traveled with the sun. We all know that, don't we? So has the gospel. The gospel started in the east. It come from the east across over into Germany, across the Mediterranean, into Germany. From Germany, across the English Channel, into England. From there, across the Atlantic, into the United States, on the east coast, and has traveled to the west coast. Now, the east and west is met. And the same sun that rises in the east is the same sun that sets in the west. Now watch the sun, S-O-N, rose as the Messiah on the eastern people. And now we've had a day since his going away of denominations and gifts together and, and so forth. We've had enough light like a gloomy day when the sun's had the clouds. And they've had denominations. We've built hospitals. We've built schools. We've built organizations. We've built all these things just exactly the way that we're supposed to do it. But he said, in the evening time, it shall be light. That same Jesus in his resurrected power will rise again as he promised in Malachi 4, as he promised in St. John 14, 12, as he promised in Luke 17, as it was in the days of Sodom, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Look what happened in the days of Sodom. Abraham, one with the promise of the coming son. Here we find him down there, and we see the sign that was done down there in Sodom. We've seen what taken place. And you know, we've never... Now, that lot was a type of the church natural down in Sodom, the organization. And they got a messenger down there. There's a couple of messengers, one of their modern Billy Graham and Old Roberts. And do you know what? There never has been a time in the church history where a man was ever sent universal to the church with his name ending with H-A-M until this time. Billy G-R-A-H-A-M, six letters. A-B-R-A-H-A-M is seven letters. But Billy G-R-A-H-A-M is right out there in Sodom, banging away and calling out. 
But remember, there was one to the church spiritual who was out. Abraham, the called out. Watch what kind of sign he gave. He never preached much of a gospel. He just told him what the promises is near to be. And he said, where is Sarah? Now remember, she was Sarah the day before that. And he was Abram the day before that. Now he said, Abraham. A-B-R-A-H-A-M. Where is S-A-R-A-H? Or S-A-R-R-A. Where is Sarah, princess, thy wife, father of nations? He said, she's in the tent behind you. And he said, I'm going to visit you according to the time of life. A man that eat the flesh of a calf, drink the milk from the cow, and eat corn cakes, drinking milk. A man, dust on his clothes, and sitting there with his back turned to the tent, said, where's Sarah thy wife? Said, she's in the tent behind you. And Sarah said, me, an old woman, as I am, 100 years old, as husband and wife has ceased long, said, have pleasure with my Lord and him old too. The Bible said, well, stricken, been years and years, just 45 years past menopause or longer than that, maybe 55 years past menopause. And me have pleasure with my husband as a young woman. She laughed up her sleeve. You know, and that, what that man, that man in that human flesh said, why did Sarah laugh? Amen. That's right. Praise Amen. Amen. What happened? Abraham called that man Elohim. Amen. Almighty God represented a human being. Yeah. Jesus, our Lord, said, as it was in the days of Lot, so shall it be at the coming. Watch when the Son of Man is being manifested, made known. Luke 17. When the Son of Man in the last days is being revealed. The Son of Man being revealed. His gospel is identifying it. As it was in the days of Lot. Look how they're doing now, perverted nations. Oh, my. Look at the homosexuals and look at what we got now. The church is a mess. The nation is a mess. And the whole thing, God's belching it out from the top of the earth. The whole thing is a mess. Geographically and also in material. The scene is set. Isn't it time for God to come back in human flesh? Amen. The word that's sharper than a two-edged sword and a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart to appear on the scene to make Jesus Christ the same yesterday, Amen. today, and for It's a promised word that's been lauded for this day. Amen. We're living in this day. And God is here with us to manifest that and make it true. Amen. Let us bow our heads. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, you said it shall be light in the evening time. We see, Lord, by all signs, nations are breaking, Israel's in her homeland, earthquakes in diverse places, man's heart's failing, perverted minds, reprobate concerning the truth. As Jambers and Jambers withstood Moses, you said, man of reprobated mind, given over to delusions to believe a lie and be damned by it. But you promised in that day that you'd make yourself known. The Son of Man would be revealed, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, day, and forever, by his same characteristic that identified him in every age. May he tonight, Lord God, great Jehovah, Elohim, yes. come down in your people tonight, Lord. Come down and make yourself known that believers might believe, that people might understand and know that you still remain God. And you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And then, Lord, those who are ordained to healing and those who are ordained to eternal life will reach up and get a hope, Lord. For this is the time of visitation. May it not pass in vain. I ask in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. How many believe that's the truth? That's the gospel. Hallelujah. Now. Are we living in that day? That's the next thing. If it is, God's solemnly obligated to identify. Now, if you will give me your undivided attention, I'm going to be just a little bit late. I told you tonight, maybe 15 minutes. We give out prayer cards. Huh? A's, A's. All right, let's start right quick. A number one. Now I'll call you just one at a time, so you stand right over here, if you will. A number one. Who's got prayer card A number one? Raise up your hand. Now, if you can't raise up, I'll, some of them will come get you. A number one. All right. Now, just come as your call. Just your number. All right. A number one. All right. Number two. Would you raise up your hand? Number two. Prayer card. A number two. Raise up your hand. Would you come, lady? Now, if you're somebody crippled and they can't get up, the ushers will pack you. Number two. Three. Just raise your hand at the same time real quick if you'll call. Number three. Would you raise your hand? Right here, lady. Number four. Raise your hand. 
Number four, pray, uh, number four, come, all right? Number five, prayer card number five, right here, lady. Number six, um, can she walk? Okay, that's, uh, take her chair down there. The lady's sick, I think, or maybe her husband or who it was sitting there with her. It's a, take her chair there. She's, all right. Number seven, number eight, number nine, nine, I get, yeah, here, nine, nine ten. Number 10, prayer card 10, 11, 12, 13, 13, 14. Uh, go down to the other end, down there, uh, 14, 15. All right, get, get right. Uh, just wait just a minute. These get in line and see where we're at here. Just a minute. Now, the rest of you just hold your card just a minute. Now, how many in this congregation that... Are, are sick and don't have no prayer card, raise up your hands like this. All right? Ever, I don't care where you are. All right? Now, just be river. Now, look. While they're getting the prayer line lined up, you all give me your undivided attention. Now, you must listen to what I'm telling you. See? Notice. One time there was a woman. Jesus was passing through the country and he crossed over the sea and he went into a place and this woman had a blood issue. And all the priests and them was out there was making fun of him, of course. And this bunch out there believed him. And he was going through the crowd. And the woman said within her heart, now listen close now. Are you listening? Say amen. amen. Right, this, now, the woman, see, on anything distracts from what you're doing. You see, every person is a, I'm not dealing with you as a, as a body. I'm dealing with you as a spirit, a soul. See, in that moving, you got your mind going somewhere else. See, I'm trying to get a hold of that. Notice. Now, as a man looked upon Paul earnestly, believing, Paul said, I perceive you have faith to be healed. Now, notice, this woman, as she's passing through here, she couldn't get to him. Everybody was putting her arms around him and everything. Let's say just for, say, just for saying now, she didn't have a prayer card. And she couldn't get in the line. And so everybody, hello, Rabbi. I say, are you the prophet? Uh, we, we believe that there's coming a prophet, but I, I don't know yet. See, I, I'm not sure. I would get put out of my church if I believe that. See, uh, you know, just the same old story over. So then this little woman, she believed it. So she slipped by and she said, if I can touch the border of his garment, I'll be made well. So she touched him. Now, if anybody ever seen the Palestinian garment, you got an underneath garment and then the outside garment swings free. Now, if some woman touched one of you man's coat, just the tail of your coat like that, and went away, you'd never know it in a crowd like that. How about that big garment hanging that far out from me? And she was down on her knees and just touched his garment and went back. Jesus stopped. He said, who touched me? And look what Peter said now with the keys to the kingdom. In other words, let's just put it in our day's work. Well, Lord, you say well, some of the awfulest things, well, then people will think that you're crazy. There's something wrong. Everybody's touching. Everybody said, hello, Rabbi. Say, are you the divine healer? Say, so are you. And say, well, you got a graveyard full of people up here. If you want to raise one for us, uh, come up and we'll believe you if you'll do that. And some for him, some against, just like his in every crowd. See? And making fun and some believing him. And Peter said, well, everybody's touching you. Why would you say such a thing as that? He said, but I perceive that I have gotten weak. Virtue's gone from me. That's strength. Look. He looked around on the audience and he found the little woman. She couldn't hide it. See, she had that seed laying in there. Oh God, give us that seed. That's what we need right now. He found her and he told her of her blood issue. Said her faith had healed her. Look, you say that if he was here tonight, I'd do the same thing. If he walked out through this building night, you believe you touch him, you'd be made whole? Well, let me tell you. In the book of Hebrews, the third chapter, it says that he is right now a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. Amen. How many believe that to be the truth? Amen. Well, if he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, how would he act today? The same as he did yesterday. Is that right? Now, you don't have to be up here. You just believe and you say this. Now, Lord, I, I, this is all strange, but the man tells it out of the Bible. It sounds, it sounds strange in every age. But search it and see if the scriptures. Jesus said, search the scriptures. They testify of me. Okay. Now, search the scriptures. That's true. We're in the last days. All nature is proving it's the last days. The church and its conglomeration, you're all going to the great big ecumenical slaughter pretty soon up here. You see, just a, the mother harlot and all of her daughters, just as, as the Bible said, taking the mark of the beast and don't know it. See? All, we get to that later. Notice, now, while he's present, if we can get his presence here, you out there without a prayer card, you touch his garment. 
He's the high priest. How you do it with your faith? Touch his garment and see if he don't turn and do the same thing he did then. The Bible said he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. That would be very convincing. You believe that? All right. Now, everybody, don't nobody stir around now. Be real reverent. See, you must respect the Holy Spirit. Respect. Only way you'll ever get anything from God is to respect his message. Respect it. Now, listen. Let's just take... All you Methodists, Baptists, Pentecostals, and Catholic and all, just take your religion, your denomination, and sit over here for a side a few minutes and say, if he is the word, the word is a discerner of the thoughts that's in the heart. That was the Messiah yesterday. That's him today. It's got to be. And he promised it today. Now, now here's a little lady standing here. Now, don't nobody move. Just be real reverent. And stand still. Now, I... By, by a gift. Now, a gift is just not something you take like a, a chopping axe and go to chopping and cutting away. That's wrong. A gift is know how to get yourself out of the way. It's just relax yourself and get yourself out, and then God comes in and uses you the way He wants to. A gift is get yourself out of the way. See, not something you put in your hand, go stabbing and sticking. That, that ain't God. See, the thing we do is just get yourself out of the way, then the Holy Spirit comes in and goes using it anyway. And he wants to use it. Amen. Now, you got to get yourself out of the way. No matter what God would do here, he has to do it on you too. No matter how much he'd anoint me, he's got to anoint you. If you don't, many mighty works he could not do. Now, I believe I've seen some, a little boy look like sit over here in a wheelchair or something. I thought I'd seen a man back there. No matter what it is, where you are, now you just believe. Here's a little woman has sat here, bowed over. Now, remember, I cannot heal anybody. There's no such a thing as any man healing. It's God. How many understands that now? Amen. Healing is already purchased is to get you to believe that His presence is here to keep His Word. Now, if I've told you His Word, that He promised to do this, and you all believe it, now if He does it, that identifies Him here. Now, here's a woman standing here. A little lady. She's much younger than I am. And here's a picture of St. John 4. A man and a woman meets the first time. We're strangers, I suppose, young lady, are we? To one another. We are. Now, I want the audience to look. I do not know her. I have never seen her. You heard her just say, I don't know her. She doesn't know me. Here we stand. Now, she might be uh, sick. She might be financially. It might be domestic trouble. It might be for somebody else. I don't have the least idea. I don't know the woman. Never seen her. But... If Christ was standing here with this suit on it, he gave me. Now, and if say she's sick, if she'd say, Lord, uh, will you heal me? Well, he'd say right back to her, he can't do no more until tell her he's already done it. How many believe that? See, he couldn't do it. But he could identify himself as being the Messiah. He would know that because he'd do that, had the same characteristic. Now, it wouldn't be me if he did that. Because... First, it was God in the pillar of fire, God above us, then God with us in Christ, now God in us. See, sons of God. In the adoption that Christ come to do to redeem God's attributes as he did at the beginning. Now, if his word dwells in here and I've told the truth and that is it, and the word is in here, in my heart, then God will identify himself as that being the truth. Then what ought that to do to this congregation? What ought to do when you see the scripture right here before you? Now, now I have to talk to the woman because I've been preaching. Just talk to her just a minute till the Holy Spirit gets moving and then you all start believing. Now, we'll see you tomorrow night. Now, I see this here. You're, you're in another world, another dimension. You just, you don't know what's taking place. You, everyone who's on the microphone, just keep it stepped up. Now, I just want to talk to you like our Lord did the woman at the well. Now, I'm a man, you're a woman, the first time we've met on earth. And, uh, and now, if uh, he told her I want to drink a water or something like that. You remember the story? Did you ever read that in the Bible? You read it. All right. Now, if the Lord Jesus will do the same thing tonight, will kind of reveal to me what your trouble is or what you've done or, or what you're here for or something other like that, you'd know it, it had to come from some supernatural power. Would you believe it to be what I've showed you the Scripture says it's going to be? We see the earthquakes. We see the world in this chaos. We see the denominations the way they are. And it's time for that to happen, isn't it? You believe that? Well, now, if he would identify himself with that, that had to be God. It couldn't be me as a man. I'm just your brother. Now, you are a Christian. Not because you're saying, praise the Lord. You could be a deceiver standing there saying that. See, 
But if it was, it, it, he would know it. See? But I feel your spirit vibrating. It's true. You're a Christian. Now, if the Lord Jesus will reveal to me what's wrong with the woman, how many will believe now with all your heart? I look on me, sister, just a moment here. See, now, I just, it's, it has to be a vision. You see, it has to see it in some way. Call it. Yes, sir? Now, here it is. Praise be to God. I take every spirit in here now under my control. In the name of Jesus Christ, be reverent. Look here just a moment, lady. Look on me. Now's the time for the Lord to say something or do something. If you're conscious, if you've ever seen that picture of that light is standing between me and the woman, and she's here, she's suffering with a blood disease. It's a diabetes. If that's right, raise up your hand. Now what? Someone might say, you just guess that. Look here, young lady. You're a very fine person. Look here. Um, you believe me to be God's servant? You do. I can't heal. I don't know what it was told. You ever what it was is true, wasn't it? Here's something else. I see a, a girl. It's a little girl that you're praying for. It's got something in their ear. It's a running ear, isn't it? That's, it's, it's, that's right. It's going to be well. You're going to be well. I go well. I believe it. Believe, sisters. Now you believe that he's the same yesterday, today, and today. You can just believe. Just, just have faith. In it. On that. See, it discerns the thoughts and intents of the heart. How many knows the word does that? The Bible shows you've been reading the Bible. Now, no matter where you are, believe now, the anointing. How many seen that picture of the angel the Lord is talking over here? Now, that same light's not two foot from where I'm standing right now. See, it's another dimension. You would See, we only live in five. This is another one. Now, be reverent just a moment. Now, here's a lady. Uh, I don't know her. I've never seen her. We're strangers to each other, I suppose. And this is our first time meeting. And just a man and a woman. And if I could do anything for you, I, I'd certainly do it. But I... I, I'm just a man. But by a gift of God, I want to identify, I want Jesus to identify himself to the word that I've just preached. To show that this is the hour, the word that's lauded for this hour, that we pass the denominational ranks. We're fixing to go to the rapture. Just trying to get people faith to believe. See, just like in the, the pyramids. See, that headstone that never did come on. See, on your dollar bill, it's got it. See. And now that ministry with the headstone, where it was way down here in the Lutheran, Wesley, and down through, it's just not a pyramid doctrine now, see. I'm just showing this for an illustration. That headstone will have to be so perfect like the rest of them till it fit right straight into it. The ministry of Christ will be in his church just exactly like him in spirit when he comes to take the church and redeems the whole thing. You believe that? I just said that because of relaxed little sits. Visions are hard. That one woman touched his garment and he said, I perceive virtue. And that was the Son of God. What about me, a sinner? Say, see, you understand. Now, if the Lord Jesus will reveal to me your troubles, will you, um, now don't be scared, that won't hurt you. You have a real strange feeling. You see, that's when that light settled over you. Now, that, so the people don't raise your hand up. So real sweet, real kind feeling. See, see, just moved over you. Now, you couldn't hide your life at all. You're suffering with a sinus condition. And that's right. You got somebody on your heart you're praying for? Aren't you? That's your husband. And that husband has trouble with his eyes, which is caused by sugar diabetes. And that's exactly what it's in. Now, believe with all your heart for both of you. You believe? And according to your faith, be it unto you, my sister. Have faith. Don't doubt. Believe with all your heart. Now, we are strangers, too, with each other. You believe that now standing in the presence of a man wouldn't make you feel like that. See, you know it's something besides me. I'm just as... It's like that desk there. It's just a desk, and I'm just a man. But you believe you're in his presence, not mine, his presence. Thank you. See, you really believe that, too. And you must believe it because I see a shadow. See? Now, you must believe. Now you're suffering uh, with inward troubles, inward organs. You've had an operation. That's right. It's oper and it's no good. You're still bothered. That's exactly right. Then you have severe headaches here, bother you. Now, you know something has to know those things. That you believe now you receive it? You believe it? All right, go receive it. And in the name of the Lord Jesus. Everybody now. You believe that God can reveal to me the thing that you're desiring? 
Would you believe it then that it would, that knot on your side would go away? <laughs> All right, then go believe it. And then it'll, it'll do it. I know you're weak. I don't want to keep you no longer than I can help. You believe me to be God's servant? Yes. You do. I'm a stranger to you. And we don't know each other. And if I could help you, I would sure do it, the lady. I'd, I'd walk, crawl, push a quarter with my nose through the streets of the city to help you because you're, you're young and you are shattered. I realize now after I spoke to you and said that, you do know what's wrong. So you know that you must die right away if something isn't done for you. you got a female disorder. It's in your females and it's malignant. It's a cancer. And you must die right away if God doesn't help you. That's right. You believe it, he'll heal you? It, look, sister, that's, that's your only hope. Believe it right now with all your heart and live for the kingdom of God. I lay my hands upon the little lady in the name of Jesus Christ and condemn the devil that's taken her life. May he leave her and may this girl live for the kingdom of God. Amen. God bless you, sister. Believe it now with all your heart. Believe it. Another shadow. You believe that God can heal it and make it well, take it away from you? Had a real strange feeling when that was taken care of, didn't you? It really actually left you right there. That's right. You believe it with all your heart and stay away from you. God bless you. Amen. Look on me, sister. You want to go eat your supper and feel good about it again? Just go ahead. That falls your lead in your beat. Amen. Look this way, lady. What you scared of? You got a nervous condition. It's been bothering you for a long time. You believe that God can heal that nervousness and make 90% of this audience is vibrating with the same thing right now. And that's exactly right. See, you want a place to put your foot always. You, they all tell you, get next to yourself and believe this, that. But you got to have a starting place. You're on it right now. Believe it, will you? The Word of God says you're free. Do you believe it? All right, go on and be free of it. God bless you, sister. Believe God can heal diabetes and make you well. And you do? Just keep moving. Say, thank you, Lord Jesus. I'll go and believe it all my life. <laughs> Nervous? A lady's trouble and you have female disorder. Do you believe that God can have stomach trouble too? Do you believe that God can make you well? Go on your road rejoicing. Say, thank you, Lord. Look on me, sir. You're a mighty strong man, but them nerves are mighty weak. You believe it's going to be ended tonight? Go receive it in the name of the Lord Jesus. Believe it with all your heart. Come, sister. Look this way. Yes, I see you trying to get up. It's crippled at the side of the bed. You've got arthritis. You believe that God will make you well? Just go on, believe it, and say, Jesus Christ makes me well. Believe it with all your heart. My sister, do you believe that God can heal that diabetes and make you well too? Or go on your road and say, Thank you, Lord Jesus. Come, lady. He would like to make you believe you're going to lose your mind. He's been telling you that, but he's alive. You're free now. Go on and rejoice. Jesus Christ. Oh, believe God can heal that stomach trouble. Make you well. Go on your road rejoice and say, thank you, Lord Jesus. Come, lady. Now, the same thing. Don't you let them tell you that. It's a nervous condition. You believe that God's going to make you well tonight. You're only hoping good. Start on your road rejoicing, happy, smiling, and be like you used to be. You believe with all your hearts? How many believes now with all your hearts? I believe, I believe Jesus saves and his blood washes whiter than snow. What about you out in the audience? You believe it? You pray now. Say, Lord Jesus, a man's away from me. Some of you back in here somewhere, boy, pray and believe. This man sitting right back here. Gallbladder trouble. You believe God will heal the gallbladder and make you well? You, your faith. You touched something. I don't know him, but he touched something. That lady rejoicing next to you there. You believe that God will heal the arthritis in you, lady, and make you well? You believe it? All right, you can, read. You can have your... The one sitting right next to you, you got trouble with your eye. Do you believe God will heal that eye trouble and make you well? All right, if you believe it, you can have it also. One sitting right next to you has got trouble with the lip. Do you believe that God will heal that growth on your lip and make you well? You can have yours also. I challenge you to believe it. Amen. Have faith in God. Don't doubt. Just believe. Have faith. 
a lady saying you're looking back there so honestly, sitting back suffering with heart trouble. You believe that God will heal the heart trouble and make you well, lady? If you do, you can have what you ask for. Yeah. Now you put your handkerchief up to your face, you got trouble with your neck and with your back. It's caused from an automobile accident. You're hitting an automobile. It's hurt your neck and back. Do you believe you're going to get well? You can have what you ask for. What about over here? Somebody over here wants to believe? There sits a lady looking at me. She's real nervous, sitting right there looking at me. That's her son sitting next to her. It's got heart trouble. Do you believe that God will heal both of you? Do you raise up your hand? Say, I accept it. Then you can be healed in the name of Jesus Christ. God's characteristics identify himself. Do you believe he's here? How many believers? Lay your hands on one another then. Put your hands over on one another. Put your hands on each other then. Our Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, may the devil leave this audience. May he be cast out of the 